Welcome to our show. I'm Lois Lindstrom. Today I will be interviewing Alan Bjerga, a journalist who has covered food and agricultural issues for more than a decade for Knight Ritter Newspapers and Bloomberg News. He is also the author of the book we will be discussing today, Endless Appetites, How the Commodities Casino Creates Hunger and Unrest. Welcome to the Bookman's Corner, Alan. Thank you. Your, your book, Endless Appetites, is an interesting and illuminating account of what it means to be a farmer in the modern world, and it provides food for thought about how treating food as a commodity, like shares on the stock market, impacts our ability to affordably feed people. Everyone is interested in the price of food. You also paint a compelling picture of ways to stabilize food prices worldwide to close the hunger gap. As a busy reporter in Washington, D.C., and the former president of both the National Press Club and the North American journalist, Agricultural Journalist, you're well connected. This is your first book. How did the opportunity to write it present itself? A, a lot of the opportunity came out of my work at Bloomberg News. Um, that makes sense. The organization uh, took a real interest in hunger issues, and especially in the 2008, 2008 period, when you had a real spike in food prices that was unlike something that we had seen for at least of a generation. Uh, the organization, to its credit, put together a series of stories on hunger. Uh, I wrote the lead story in the series, which was tracking U.S. food aid in Ethiopia. Uh, that was in 2008. Okay. Uh, two years later, uh, John Wiley and Sons, which has a relationship with Bloomberg through Bloomberg Press, the imprint for this book, uh, was interested in a reporter looking at commodities issues. Going back to my work in 2008, I had an opportunity to sort of flesh that out come up with a broader topic that Wiley was interested in, and, and really in the fall of 2010, work started on this book in earnest. Well, I think it's so fascinating that you interviewed farmers worldwide for this book. And, um, but I think, my, to me, my question is, what is the ability of the United States and other agricultural countries around the world to feed the world population today? Uh, the world is producing enough food today uh, to feed the world. If you take a look well, at that's statistics, really <laughs> if you take a look at statistics, um, according to the United Nations, uh, an adult needs about 2,100 calories of food a day okay. uh, to survive and be healthy. The world often produces in the typical year 2,800 calories of food per person per day. The question becomes efficiency, the question becomes distribution, the question becomes affordability and access. Right. Um, famine in the conventional sense of people starving to death is not as common as it once was. Mm -hmm. uh, but we still have some amazing problems with malnutrition. And one of the real tragedies of it is, is that it's not necessary, given the production that we have today. It's about flaws in the market. And that's really something that I tried to explore in this book. Yeah, it was fascinating reading this book. I, uh, and of course, as I read in your author's notes, you grew, you grew up on a farm in Minnesota. And how did that affect your writing of this book, and, and what kind of farm was it? Well, first of all, how it affected the book is it was just very natural to talk to farmers. Um, having grown up and come up in that sort of a background. You knew uh, what to ask. Well, right? farmers around the world will have some very similar concerns. I don't care whether it's one acre in Kenya or 10,000 <laughs> acres in North Dakota. Okay. Uh, you, you worry about the weather. Okay, uh, you course. worry about the competition in the market. You worry whether you have chosen the right crops that the market wants. And the insects, I guess. And yeah. insects and pests. And how are you going to control this? And, and you worry about your government and what the government policies are going to be and what the trade markets are going to be okay. like. And so having grown up on the farm that I grew up on, which uh, was uh, for several years we had beef cattle and then we switched to sheep. Um, and uh, we always had cover crops. So you're, you're raising alfalfa and clover and hay and then we to, had a little, to feed the sheep right yeah that the, there was pasture land and then of course we had this large garden that was essentially a field size that my mother tended and and that would be sweet corn and that was strawberries and blueberries and basically mm. anything that could grow in Minnesota um, and it's it's interesting because when you grow up in that environment of course you're surrounded by other people who are growing up in that and you mm. don't realize until later when you're living in an urban environment just how good the food you had when that's you were growing right. up that's right um, memories and, right? Uh, yes and and you know, the deep freeze where someone would go deer hunting and there would be venison for the winter. Right, right. Um, but it also gives you a real appreciation of the land and how proper stewardship of the land can really create a bounty for everyone that's possible in this world, but you have to get the markets right. Mm. And it's a real challenge, as, as, as the book illustrates. Exactly. 
And the other thing I thought was interesting, you know, books are written from a variety of perspectives. I mean, some write to advocate, some write as critics, some write as experts. As a journalist, what is the perspective you provide regarding the problem of world hunger? Well, and that was something I thought about a lot when I was creating this book, because people write books from different directions and different topics. And my role as a, as a journalist uh, working with an organization like Bloomberg News, I really feel that journalism is a way to really advance um, understanding of topics, sure. uh, appreciation of topics, allowing people to make better informed decisions on their lives. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not trying so much to advocate for a particular worldview or a particular political agenda. Okay. Um, clearly, over the course of 70,000 words, one is going to get a sense of of where people may be um, sharing responsibility for mm -hmm. some of the problems that we have. But at the same time, you have a real uh, responsibility to your audience um, and to the readers that you're dealing with, as well as, frankly, the, the farmers and people at all levels of the food chain you're talking to your book, to be fair and to present uh, their perspectives well also yes. so that people can get that better understanding that a journalist can provide. Yes, it was, it was really interesting. And the other thought I have, of course, you know, I didn't realize the 2008 was such a global food crisis because of the uh, rising energy cost mm -hmm. and the, the drought conditions in many countries. Um, I mean, could a new global food crisis explode at any time? Uh, in the future unless governments tackle the underlying causes of hunger? Well, getting back to your question about how this book came into being, um, the original conceptualization of this book was about 2008 because 2008 was very much a perfect storm for food prices. Okay. You had that rise in energy costs. You had some weather disasters in other parts of the world. Right. Um, Russia and, was one. Yeah. Well, Russia was in 2010. Okay. 2008, you're dealing with some flooding and some droughts in Australia. Okay, it's um, Australia. Yes, you, you, you have various issues. But the idea, sort of an argument of the book was is that here was this problem that we had, it could happen again. Mm -hmm. While I'm writing this book, and in chapter one, I'm in the Chicago Board of Trade. That's my first travel for this book. Okay. That same week, you have in Tunisia the self-immolation of Mohammed Bouazizi, yes. uh, which was one of the touchstone events of the Arab Spring. That's right. He was a vegetable vendor. Mm -hmm. um, and what you saw during that period, as I'm starting to write this book saying that 2008 could happen again, you saw it happening again in yes. 2010, 2011. That made the book a much more of a current events book yes. in the most literal sense than, yes. than I would think at, at the outset. Um, and so now we are in another cycle uh, in food prices where the United Nations has just said recently that the prices are going down, things are moderating. You know, farmers will respond to high prices by producing more. Yes. And yet, um, some of these fundamental factors that are in place, when the prices start to go down, everybody seems to think that the problem has gone away. Well, it hasn't. Um, and unless there is action, unless there is vigilance, yes, you will see a repetition of these spikes because that is the market world that we're living in right now. Wow, wow. Well, um, how do markets present opportunity for small farmers? You know, I think of, I think of these big, huge industrial farms. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there a danger that small farmers will be swallowed by large multinational agribusiness? That's one of the big questions that people have about um, the developing world because when you have these issues of distribution and these issues of productivity, there are large agribusinesses that can do, play a really key role in, mm -hmm. in further developing that potential. Mm -hmm. But then exactly that's the worry that happens is, is that our, our, our poor farmers in developing countries who maybe don't have a lot of market power, maybe don't have a lot of financially economic, political clout, are they sort of going to be swallowed up? Yes. I think that uh, there's reason to be optimistic that these these roles can be played positively. Being in Kenya, um, talking to farmers who are active in the Kenya Organic Agriculture Network, right. you know, guess what? There are prospering middle class buyers in Nairobi who also want their organic food. And there's a role for that in this market. That's wonderful, that's wonderful news. Um, at the same time, it would be ridiculous to simply say to large corporations, no, stay out of here, this is pristine. Mm -hmm. I, I sometimes think that there is almost a danger that people will romanticize poverty and say, well, this is a simpler way mm -hmm. and these these grand industrial methods shouldn't be brought in. Well, there is a role in feeding the world and feeding the world cheaply and efficiently that with the, with the expertise that, that larger businesses have, it would be ridiculous to just object that, to that out of hand and say, we want it to be done through this system. There are, there are room, there's room for, both for, systems. for many systems for of many agriculture systems. Okay. successfully to feed the world. Well, that's good. Well, um, I found it interesting that in the 21st century, more food is being grown than ever before. 
Uh, but why is there more hunger? I mean, why are you, are, are, oh, it's, not, it's not hunger, it's malnourished people. Right, why right. is that? Well, a lot of it, you know, we have 7 billion people. So you just look at the raw numbers and they're going to be higher. What has been disturbing in the last generation is, is that as a proportion of the world population, the number of people who would be, the term would be food insecurity, people yeah. who aren't certain of where their next meal is coming from. Right. Um, the proportion was declining for about, going back to about 1970 when the data starts getting really solid. Mm -hmm. Um, you saw about 35 years of decline and what you've seen in about the last half decade is that number has sort of stagnated and now that proportion, depending on what's going on in food prices and economies, is actually starting to go up slightly again. Okay. And a lot of that is very much related to inequality and poverty in certain okay. areas of the world. Okay. Okay. A classic example of this is India. Mm -hmm. um, 20 years ago, you saw food insecurity in India of Terrible. about 20 percent. Yes. About 20 percent. We've seen an incredible rise in prosperity and growth in India in the last 20 years. It's a big story. It you is know, a big how story. India is emerging. That's right. So the proportion uh, in 20 years has gone from 20 to Two. 20, 21. 21. 21. It's, it's increased. It's increased slightly. Mm -hmm. It's not a huge increase. It's it stayed stagnant. But when you look at the growth in India, you would mm -hmm. think there's this huge decline. Well, the issue is income inequality. Um, Okay. P people who are impoverished remain impoverished. That rise in India. They has don't not have been the money. They don't have the, the money way. for the food. Then they can't. They can. They can't afford it. It's directly related to poverty. China okay. now, on the other hand, has actually seen a real decrease in hunger in the last twenty years. Hmm. And part of that, frankly, is is that the rural areas where your poverty and your hunger is most endemic, which hmm. is ironic when you think about it, because that's where the farmers are. That's right. Um, there has been a more equal distribution of a rise. There's still a, a real hunger problem okay. in China, but it's developed differently from India. And part of that is the role of social safety nets within populations. Interesting, interesting. Well, uh, I thought that the, it was interesting, that chapter in your book, when you gave a brief history of how Chicago made a market that successfully connected growers in the Midwest mm -hmm. with consumers in the East and beyond. But something happened in the 1980s what market mechanism triggered financial speculators to enter the food market? Um, there were some changes in government rules and regulations dating to the 1980s that had a profound impact on commodity markets. Um, they were Commodity markets and commodity trading had always kind of been walled off from the rest of the financial world with the idea that food, energy, consumable goods are different um, right. in terms of They're their necessity vital. to live. They're, that's right. To, to live, yeah, yes. That's right. And, and it was possible to, for companies, of course, they want to hedge their risk. They want to deal with um, changes in the market, and sure. that's what the markets were doing. Mm -hmm. um, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, you saw an expansion of who could be a player and the reasons they could be players in the commodities markets. And you started seeing exemptions that were given to groups like, like Goldman Sachs, like large financial players, where suddenly commodities were now not just being used to hedge your your product risk, that, that you wanted to be sure that you had corn three months from now. Right. It was also being used for financial risk, which meant that now things like fluctuation of the dollar, inflation rates, um, macroeconomic factors are having more of an interplay with commodity markets than maybe what you would have seen 30 years ago. Right. But these were, these were congressional um, legislative moves that, that, that changed things. In Very much in sort of the vein of deregulation that you were seeing oh, during right, that period. Right, deregulation, okay. And, and, and you will see arguments saying that, look, this made markets it's more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, this brought wealth to these markets. Mm -hmm. And then you see sort of the reverberations of the critique of it that you see all over with Wall Street in this era, right, right. which is this took power out of the hands of folks on the street right. and put it in the hands of large banks. And, and that's the controversy that's really been resonating today. Well, this is it. We had like the, the crop markets that were first established in the 1800s that helped stabilize mm -hmm. agricultural commodity prices, changing in such a way that rich nations were taking food from the mouths of the poor. Is that you will see? You will you will hear that accusation made. Um, that argument that when you're seeing this volatility that is going back and forth, mm -hmm. it, it, it helps a lot with corporate bottom lines. But yeah. <laughs> if food prices double in Libya in the course of a year, and you're in a country where poor people will pay 70% of their income on food, well, 70% times two is 140%, and that doesn't work in a budget. I don't no, care where you that's are. That's right. That's right. It's, it's shocking. Well, um, it's interesting that you did interview farmers in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, is organic farming coming to the forefront in those countries, do you think? Um, organic farming has to be kept in perspective and, and understanding what it is. I mean, frankly, a lot of developing world farming is organic farming. 
because it's not They using, can't afford the pesticides, right? They're not using commercial pesticides <laughs> right, and right, fertilizers, right. and so it is by definition organic, and a lot of it isn't particularly productive okay. in, in a yield standpoint, okay. um, simply because uh, the farming practices aren't there. And I, I don't really want to get into the whole what is better organic or conventional agriculture debate, because there are several other books about that, and you can talk for an entire sure, book about sure. it. But what you can say is, is that um, Rural areas, especially near developing, rising urban areas, there is, just like in the United States or Europe, a rising consumer demand for organic sure. foods. And that creates a real market opportunity for farmers in developing areas to use this. Now, just to give you an example of some of the challenges, um, I was in Nicaragua and mm -hmm. I was speaking with farmers who are using organic fertilizer, which, you know, is very much... What came? What was fertilizer was made of for millennia? That's right. Um, but synthetic fertilizers are often actually less expensive because when they're petroleum or gas based, um, it's going to simply have some economies of scale. Where if, you, frankly, you're waiting for your cow or your livestock <laughs> and to go and, and, and deal with the composter, it, it, the economics don't work the same. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Um, well, what do you see happening over the next five to ten years regarding food prices? if energy prices zoom upward? Well, if energy prices zoom upward, food prices will follow. Um, I actually have a graphic in that book uh, where you can look at changes in oil prices monthly and food prices monthly over the last decade. And it's essentially the same graph. I, energy is such a big component of food prices, especially when you have export markets because transportation becomes part of the so cost critical, of food. So critical, isn't it? So if, so if energy prices spike, food prices will spike as well. If food prices are being driven more by traditional farmer supply demand, mm -hmm. um, you're going to see more of a fluctuation up and down because from year to year, depending on what the weather is, depending on what the farmer crop decisions are, you see supply and demand being aligned differently with each specific year. This is where climate change becomes a big part of the debate because there's a real feeling that if weather is becoming more volatile, which it seems to be happening, mm -hmm. um, you're going to see more volatility in agricultural production every year. And without adequate reserves, that means you're going to have tighter markets and bigger spikes from year to year. All right. Well, the... Um what do you think are the or some of the most pressing examples of food security issues that we're seeing in the world today? I mean, what what are the most pressing issues? Well, drought and famine in the Horn of Africa. Um, is is that just uh, there continually? I mean, do they have every year? Well, it seems like it, doesn't it? It does, um, because that's the only time you ever hear about it is when <laughs> there's a problem, and 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 their problems do tend to be more frequent and more acute in that part of the world. Um, what is interesting is, is that there actually has been progress that's been made in that. Um, you think back, I think for an American audience, when people think of the largest famines, they think back to the 1980s and what was happening in Ethiopia because yes. that was sort of the Live Aid era when you saw all this attention being given to this. If you take a look at, for example, what was going on in Somalia last year, you had large numbers of people exposed to hunger and malnutrition. Yes, you saw that on the news, yes. You did not see it as much, say, in the heart of Ethiopia or in Kenya or in places where government Governments actually have made progress oh, in good. better structure, okay. better distribution towards it. Somalia remains a very poorly, if governed at all, area. It's, it's a civil war in a way. And there's a real yeah. relation between quality of government governance and hunger in the yeah. world today. Yes. So in, in those areas, you're going to continue to see those problems. Um, other pressing areas really is it really does deal with the sort of issue of income inequality um, and cash-strapped governments. You know, this is something, I talk in Chapter 6 about the Arab Spring in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And Egypt has had bread riots in the past. Yes. Um, they have a history of it. In 1977, 2008, you saw unrest. Yes. This time, there were a lot of different things going on. I wouldn't say that food caused Arab Spring, but it's That's certainly it. part of the mix of things that made people unhappy. In 2011, and this happened in Egypt and other gov governments, frankly, governments could do a better job of buying off their civilians in the sense of subsidizing food costs. Because we have this fiscal situation that we are in right now, mm -hmm. government, governments don't have that same ability to, to make those payments to help sort of calm some people down. Because they, they don't have the tax revenues. They don't to, have the to, revenues to, they, they, and they can't right. handle the debt. And so right. you end up with situations where people are being upset mm -hmm. and their government can't mm -hmm. do anything about it. And that is a feeder of right. instability well, I, we'll be watching. That's, I, well, I couldn't get over how much uh, income is, goes toward food in Egypt. In other words, mm -hmm. an individual uh, family's income, was, what did you say, 40 percent? Right, right. That's shocking. I had, uh, when this book first came out, there were some stories coming out about peanut prices and how peanut prices are really up and it's going to make 
uh, you know, food more expensive in the U.S. And, and it's true. But you wouldn't think of food riots in the United States no. over peanuts. Well, part of that is because food kind of costs peanuts in the United States from the sense that <laughs> the average amount of income that an American spends on food is much smaller than other parts of the world. So, and the inflation is much less dramatic. So even if you have a year where, say, food inflation goes up 5%, mm -hmm. it's a burden on consumers. There's no doubt about it. But it's 5% inflation in something that's 10% of your income. Once again, let's go to North Africa, the Middle East, where especially if you're a poor person, more than half of your income is going to food, and food prices can double very quickly. Oh my gosh. It's much more of a factor and cause of volatility. Here people will grumble. In other parts of the world, they will riot. Yes, or starve, right? <laughs> Um, what, do you, what do you see uh, the role of the United Nations? Uh, how positive are they in regarding helping hungry people? Uh, I mean, could the UN be more effective? We're at a really interesting moment with the UN food organizations because uh, a new head of the World Food Program was just named, uh, Ertherin Cousin. She's an American. She's been in Rome for a couple of years now. Dealing now, now the with last issues. one, you met the last Josette one. Josette Sharon. Josette yes, Sharon. She's, she's leaving now. It's a five year term. So it's her a five term year term. Okay. Um, we also have a new uh, head of the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, which has a big repository of data on food, and they're trying to be a, more a, aggressive in terms of dealing with advocacy on hunger issues. Hmm. The UN kind of became the central part of a lot of hunger fighting efforts. A lot of this goes back to Cold War politics. Yes. Um, the Eastern Bloc didn't work well with the Americans right. and Western countries didn't deal so well with uh, the Soviet Bloc. Mm -hmm. And so the UN was sort of brought in as an honest broker. And of course, the UN gets criticized for all of the things that you hear the UN being criticized for in terms of efficiency and bureaucracy and, and waste all in and waste and yeah. such. But um, in consensus, I think the consensus is that the UN has done a reasonable job in advancing issues and, and dealing with hungry people for the last 35 years. The world, I think, is probably better off having the UN than not having the UN. And in future years, especially as, as, as attention is focused on hunger, I think you'll see it play an increasingly important role as sort of a nexus for those right. organizations. Well, what does the UN do exactly? I mean, do they have um, meetings, sure. uh, regional meetings, and to find out what the food I mean, there is a part of that. There's, there's that component. I mean, the World Food Program is the world's largest food aid distribution area. Okay. They're the 800-pound gorilla. Okay. If you're dealing with food aid in Africa, there are a lot of great groups who are doing a lot of very good work. Okay. But they're the big ones. Okay. Um, and as far as raising awareness, yes, they are the ones who will be causing the summits. Okay. They will be the ones who will be doing the reports, especially with FAO. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are sort of trying to muster attention and get don donor nations to contribute to this issue. Okay. Well, did you find people concerned about the clean water supply during your research? Um, what do you think that we have a problem with clean water in the future, with in, in several countries around the world? Uh, water is certainly a big issue um, in food and agriculture in the world. Um, it's an issue where, once again, it's about efficiency of distribution. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the issues with agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa, and especially the parts where you see the Horn of Africa, is that it's very much still rain-fed agriculture. So not only are you dealing with potential water shortages due to climate change, you're also dealing with inefficient use of the water that there is. And this gets back to infrastructure. Okay. Um, water, in a sense, is a trickier issue than food itself because there are lots of ways that a person can grow food, but you need water. You do. In all of them you to do, do it. Yes. So, so those are going to be big issues. Mm -hmm. And as you're seeing it in the Horn of Africa and you're seeing it in South Asia, and eventually it's going to spread elsewhere. Incredible. Well, you know, like from 2007 to 2009, you wrote that there were more than 60 food riots erupted worldwide, mm -hmm. leading to violent deaths. Um, and it's been reported that the number of globally hungry, hungry people has topped 1 billion in 2009. Yes. That's an amazing statistic. Um, do you see more food riots in the future? Well, I, I think it's inevitable that there will be. I mean, there always have been. I mean, food supplies were a part of the book of Genesis, if you know the That's Joseph right. story. <laughs> I mean, right. Joseph was one of the most famous grain traders in history That's because right. of his predictions of Egyptian crop markets. That's right. Um, so, yes, I think you will see continued volatility. I think you will see episodes of violence. Mm -hmm. um, the question will be, how is there a coordinated global response to this? Um, especially, this really is a problem that isn't necessary in the world today. Um, there are some... There are some problems that you really look at them and say, how are we going to deal with this? Hunger is one that can be dealt with. 
Good, good to hear. Well, what about farm subsidies here in the United States? You know, you wrote that farmers are paid not to plant certain crops in their fields. Is this a good policy? Farm subsidies are an, an interesting topic, especially in the U.S. right now, since there's going to be a new farm bill that's debated this year that sets policy. The, the issues around farm subsidies have actually changed a lot because of these high prices, because for many years, the issue was low prices in agriculture. And so you had programs that paid farmers not to plant. It was a supply management issue. Mm -hmm. Now what's needed is more supply. Um, and a lot of these subsidy programs don't seem to be applicable in the same way that they exactly. were. Exactly. So what, what, how can um, that be changed? But at the same time, farmers the worldwide would like to know that there is some sort of assurance that if there is a massive weather disaster, that they're not all wiped out in one year. This is especially true in developing nations. So you're looking at some sort of crop insurance program. You're yeah. looking at okay. ways to make sure that farming is done in an effective way while still serving marketplaces. Um, the the overproduction, the dumping issues that you may have seen 10 years ago have yeah. not been as prevalent now. Okay. But but the real issue is making sure that agricultural potential is is developed the worldwide. And in that way, uh, rich nations still have an advantage over poor nations just because they have a more developed safety net. And then I have to I have to ask you about ethanol because mm -hmm. doesn't a program that drive up the price of corn, which means that the feed for hogs and cattle is much higher. Uh, does that make sense economically? I mean, are, what do you think about this ethanol program? Well, ethanol is an issue where when you take a look at changes in oil markets and energy prices, it all becomes of a piece. You know, oil gets very high, people start looking for alternatives. Sure. Ethanol becomes an alternative, but ethanol dries up the price of corn. So foods, feedstuffs are now going up in two ways. You know, you have more scarce corn supply and you also have a more uh, expensive oil supply as well. Ethanol has potential for farmers. Farmers need an income. Ethanol creates a market. U.S. grows so much corn now and ethanol can take care of some of that. At the same time, you do have this reverberation price on world food. And, and I do think there's a real re-examination of these policies that have been incubating ethanol for many years, while at the same time uh, noting that there is an impact on food prices. Uh, food security has to be a major goal, while at the same time realizing that there are energy and farmer goals as well. So you don't see any change in U.S. policy there? Do you think? Mm. You think We've already seen changes. Okay, um, just minor changes, right? Or well, well, actually, December 31st, there used to be three major forms of ethanol support, and mm -hmm. two of them expired, and they were not renewed. Okay. Um, so that's a significant change. Also, I would note that uh, biofuels production in the U.S. is not ramping up as dramatically as it used to, okay. used to be. However, globally, you still see a lot of production. You know, you still see a lot of Brazilian sugar. You still sure. see a lot of rapeseed in the U.S., okay. in, in the European Union. Well, that's, that's all very interesting. And then I have to say that um, I really want, you have, you've covered so many issues in your book, and I wish we had like a, another 30 minutes to talk about it, but where can our viewers find your book? Uh, the book is available at fine bookstores near you. I was covering the Iowa caucuses. <laughs> I found it in a store in West Des Moines, <laughs> Iowa. Um, but it's on Amazon. It's on Barnes & Noble. Um, and it's been distributed nationwide in bookstores. So if, if you're interested in it, it's not too hard to find. And do you have a website? I do. Um, I have a Facebook page, but it's a publicly available Facebook. So you can still look at it okay. even if you're not on Facebook. It's uh, simply facebook.com um, slash endlessappetites, one word. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, and I really appreciate your being our guest on Bookman's Corner today. And I look forward to uh, seeing your next project. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for being with us. Please, please join us next month for the new edition of the Bookman's Corner. <laughs>